Okay, good afternoon, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started with the uh, afternoon program. Again, my name is George Jarrell. I'm the Director of Behavioral Health Services at Dominican Hospital. Today's symposium is being taped for future cable cast on community television in Santa Cruz County. Again, for other people to uh, take advantage of the information today that didn't have a chance to attend. In this, our second part of today's program, we're going to fo focus on military and veterans and suicide. Janet Kemp, RN, PhD, has 20 years experience working with veterans. She currently serves as the National VA Mental Health Director for Suicide Prevention. She is responsible for provider and patient education in areas of suicide awareness and prevention, current assessment and treatment strategies, and new findings in the area of suicide and assisting in implementation of suicide prevention programs throughout the VA system. Dr. Kemp directs and advises the suicide prevention coordinators at each local VA and is the national program manager for the Veterans Crisis Line. Please welcome Dr. Kemp. I want to um, thank you all for the kind invitation um, to be here and to talk about um, something that, that's incredibly important to me, but, but also to our nation and our nation's security. Um, I think you've uh, heard the, the headlines um, on the news, you've read the newspapers. Uh, certainly um, the word epidemic is, is used on a, um, a fairly uh, common basis. I'm not sure that's, that's the right word to use, but uh, the approach I think we need to take that any suicide among um, our nation's actively serving military members or our veterans is one suicide too many. And the numbers are certainly um, appalling. And um, often we look at, at war um, as time goes on and look back at what we call the signature injuries or the signature injuries or illnesses of that conflict. Um, and truly, in this particular war, perhaps uh, PTSD, traumatic brain injury, and suicide um, might be the signature illnesses and injuries that um, hopefully we'll have learned from and be able to improve not only soldiers' health um, and veterans' health, but America's health. So we need to take what we learn and, and move it on. I'm going to start with um, a video uh, called Behind the Scenes. Um, and this is a, a depiction of, of kind of what it's like to work on a regular basis at the Veterans Crisis Line. Um, and we'll talk about the Crisis Line a little later in the presentation, but right You're now I think it's helpful yourself. just to kind of yes, hear a little bit about the calls that um, come in on a daily basis. Using to cut herself. How often do you feel like this? She does have some Really? Something like this happens every day? How are you feeling right now? now? We don't know what she's well, we're here. You could have a crisis at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, but I can assure you, right, you can call here 24-7, and we will pick up the phone. We will pick it up by the second ring. It takes a gift and a special person, even a friend, to meet you where you are and walk with you. We've taken over 400,000 calls from people who have been in various levels of distress. Some of them just want information. They just want to make sure there's someone to talk to. Um, they just want to make sure that there's somebody there. And others just want to tell someone that um, they're going to die. You feel a little bit better? How about your paranoia? Four years in the United States Air Force. A licensed mental health counselor. An Army officer in the reserves and I got home from Afghanistan in 2008. I spent 14 years active duty in the Air Force. From 91 to 99, so I couldn't go, go for it. I've always worked with veterans. I'm a veteran myself. And you can also help him get housing, you know, through these. Through these. The proudest moments of my life were serving my country. I think um, we cannot do enough to help veterans. They 
deserve as much help as this country can give to them. Nothing less. Who do you see? Somebody at the VA. A veteran will wake up in the middle of the night from a nightmare and they don't want to disturb their wife, so they call us and we just sort of talk them down and get them tucked back in for the night. Uh, sometimes it's weeks and weeks of ongoing pain and struggle and they finally get our number uh, and give us a call and we connect them to services. I'm trying to understand what it is she's saying. Did she say you tried to hurt yourself in front of her? All we offer is our attention and sometimes that's enough. And so to me that's the best summary of, of the job of a responder when you're dealing with somebody who's suicidal. I think that I listen to the veterans. I listen to what they say, you know, not just hearing them, you know, actually listening to them, you know, and trying to figure out what the problem is and how, how they can be helped and help themselves. The veteran will first uh, pick up the phone, dial the, the crisis number, and then they'll hear um, uh, if you're a veteran, if you're a family member of a veteran, um, if you're in active duty services, please press 1. They'll press 1, and then there will be just a brief delay while the call is routed to Canandaigua, and then, um, and then they'll hear a, an individual person say, Thank you for calling the Veterans Crisis Center. This is good. How can I help you? You know, I had a, a guy call it said, you know, um, I, I don't know what to expect. And I said, well, why don't we start with your name? You know, tell me what's going on. You know, let, let's talk about it. I've got no problem sitting and letting a vet, uh, you know, cuss, swear, you know, cry, whatever it is that they need to do to be able to feel better. You know, and that's what we're here for. A lot of veterans are unemployed. Uh, there is, of course, a, a significant homeless population. Uh, relationship problems, uh, you name it. I mean, you know, alcoholism, drug addiction, uh, there's all, there's all kind of things. A lot of times I find that the crisis line, that it's almost as if it's a confessional. They can't see the face of the person sitting across from them. And so it makes it so that they feel more comfortable to say things that perhaps they would feel nervous about saying in front of somebody who's sitting directly in front of them. It's been incredible. We never advertised the chat service. It just opened up on the website and we've had several thousand chatters. It does help the call. I'm glad to hear that. We're always here for you. I hear it. I hear it, sir. You're really frustrated. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, I'm really glad you called us because that's part of your safety plan and you're doing the right thing. No one's going to knock on your door, sir. That's a promise. You're telling me right now you can be safe, so... All right, I'm really glad to hear that you're contracting for safety. You're following all of the right things that your treatment team has advised you to. Uh, no, I don't Good. I'm glad to hear that, sir. I'm glad to hear that. You can't do therapy an hour with somebody whose life is in crisis. So the best help I can offer is helping them first of all sort out whether they want to live or die and there are some wonderful tools for that. Just the way you and I have been able to talk pretty well today on the phone, you can get that, that kind of relationship with a counselor too. The collaboration with the SPC is one of the most impressive pieces of this whole venture. We're able to hook them up with their local suicide prevention coordinators, get them appointments within that day or the next day, get consults sent, and make sure that they get the care that they need at their local facilities. I had a gentleman that had the gun out in his hand, ready to do it. I'm tired. I just can't take this anymore. The nightmares, the flashbacks, it's overwhelming. I'm drinking all the time. You know, you're having these suicidal thoughts and I want somebody to be able to, you know, for you to be able to talk to somebody. As we talked through it together, um, he made a safety plan. He agreed to be referred to the suicide prevention coordinator, which is a huge part of what we want to do, is get them connected. And he also agreed to call us back. Well, I'm glad that you, you feel comfortable calling us. And you know that we're here for you 24-7.
so he was safe and he was willing to call us back and we were able to connect him through a conference call with his brother which turned out really well. We have the opportunity when we do a consult to the suicide prevention coordinator to ask the vet that we're speaking with kind of at the end of the call when we're getting things wrapped up do you mind if I give you a call back in a couple of weeks and just check in and see what see what's going on and see how you're doing and I don't think I've ever had a, a vet say no. Are you in crisis today? So we follow up to see what's transpired in a two or three week period. And if that individual is still in crisis, we'll do another consult. We'll wrap their VA services around them again. Veterans do call the crisis line. It surprises me every day the number of people who take us up on that offer. And we were able to talk. Uh, we were able to find some reasons for him to live that outweighed the reasons to die. Yes, I think we changed lives, saved lives. I think that, you know, a lot of guys are on the verge, you know, and right there and, you know, they get that connection from us, you know, and they get the help. Call, we'll talk to you. When you first come home, there's a lot of stress. You know, uh, the family has expectations of you. Uh, you're going through your own uh, process of being home again. You don't have to be suicidal to call the crisis line. You can have a crisis that other people might think are not crisis. If you think it's a crisis, call. That's what's important. There, that if you ask us to walk a mile with you, we'll say no. We'll walk two with you. If you're in a crisis, call. Okay, so um, uh, lesson number one, if you're going to show a video at a conference, make sure you're not in it because it's really embarrassing. <laughs> but um, lesson number two, um, veterans um, are having issues um, and uh, we, ne we need to be there for them. A few facts um, that, that go along with what you heard this morning. Um, <clears throat> we know that anywhere between 30 and 32, maybe even up to 34,000 um, U.S. deaths from suicide per year um, occur. And th those are numbers, that the latest numbers that we have from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, we, we know that approximately, or we think that approximately 20% of these are veterans, and we get that from the National Violent Death Reporting System. And for those of you who don't know, there really is no good number in the United States of the number of veterans every year who die by suicide. That's just not a number that we keep. It's not a number that states are required to submit when they submit their death records to the CDC every year. I think most of you do know there's quite a delay in the, in the period of time between when the data is available and today. So we just recently got um, the 2009 data um, and haven't really even had an opportunity to analyze that completely yet, but I'll share a little bit about what we know. So one of the things that we are working with and that the Secretary of Veterans Affairs has asked the governors of all of the states to share their data with the VA about veteran suicide um, more immediately. And as of today, we have data from um, about 40 of the 50 states. Um, the other states are in the process of sending it in to us. Um, California has promised to send us the data and we're excited about that and we expect it any day. Um, from them and we hope within the next few months um, we'll be able to roll that up and have a better more accurate picture of the number of veteran deaths um, every year. But if you do the kind of uh, pen and pencil arithmetic with using the 20% number it works out to about 18 deaths um, a day are by veterans. Um, and that we know that about five of these deaths occur among veterans receiving care in the um, Veterans Health Care Administration. 
which leaves, I mean, you can, you can do the math, um, 13 that aren't getting care in the VA. Um, and we don't know whether they're not getting care anywhere, which we suspect, um, or are getting sort of a random type, type care. Um, we know also that there are about between 950 and 1,000 suicide attempts every month among our veterans who get care in the VA, and we are able to, to track those. But again, those are only the attempts that we know about, um, and that we anticipate or we expect that there are um, several that, many, many more that we don't know about. Um, we do know that 11% um, of those who attempted suicide in, in the way we figure uh, years, which is different than the rest of the world, of course, um, uh, in 2009 and did not die as a result of this first attempt, did make a repeat suicide attempt within, within an average of nine months after that first attempt. And I think that that's an important number for, for us to, to talk about. Um, I, I don't think that that's unique to veterans, um, and we do know that uh, those second attempts and third attempts often are much more lethal than the first attempt, and there may be even some practice type behavior that goes on in these very initial attempts. We know that 7% of um, those who um, had a suicide attempt resulted in death. Um, among those who survived their first attempt and reattempted suicide within nine months, approximately 6% of those died from suicide. So the numbers are adding up um, as time goes on. We know that 33% of recent suicides um, in our system have had a history of previous attempts and that 19 of those who died by suicide were last seen um, actually in primary care as opposed to um, mental health services. So I think that's um, an also important thing to, uh, to remember. Often um, these people ha do have a depression, PTSD, or mental health diagnosis, but most often they're seen by their primary care physician as their last um, contact or, or in primary care by someone. Um, we know that there's evidence of about a 21% excess of suicides through 2007 among our um, newest war veterans um, when we compare their mortality to the U.S. general population, and that's after we adjust for age, sex, race, and, and the fact that we figure our years differently. So um, I think that that's a, a number to be aware of. And there's preliminary evidence that really suggests there are decreased suicide rates in veterans among this very young age group of veterans who use VA healthcare services relative to veterans in the same group who don't since 2006. And we think that means a couple things. Hopefully it means that, that what we've put into place may be effective. It may be starting to make a difference. Um, but probably what it means is that people who are getting care in this age group in the VA are getting care as opposed to um, veterans in the same age group who are coming back not hooked up in the VA services and most likely not hooked up into community resources either. So um, I think, think there is a little bit of hope in that statement that, that perhaps treatment is, is helpful and treatment works. Um, and we need to um, capitalize on that. Um, more than 60% of suicides among utilizers of our services are among patients with a known diagnosis of a mental health condition. Um, and remember, this, is, this includes all age group. And actually within the VA, the age group of um, veterans um, that, that we're concerned about varies from um, those who are 18 and 19 years old right up um, into those who are in their 80s. And we have um, suicides among all of those age groups. Another thing that I think is important um, to, to think about is that veterans are more likely than the general population to use firearms. Um, as a means for suicide, and Lisa spoke about that a little bit this morning about the lethality of that method. Um, one of the things that's concerning when we talk about women veterans is that women veteran suicide rates are 
um, actually quite a bit higher than women non-veteran suicide rates um, in the United States. And one of the reasons for that, we believe, is that women veterans are more likely to use guns as a method of choice than um, women who are not veterans. So they're more familiar with guns, they're more likely to have them in their homes, um, and they're more likely to choose that method. So I think we need to, um, to think about that when we, when we work with women veterans. And I did want to talk just briefly um, um, for a few minutes about the Action Alliance. Um, if you all are not um, familiar with the Action Alliance, um, several years ago, in 2001, the National Strategy for Suicide Prevention um, was published. Um, and this did provide um, us all with kind of a blueprint of suicide prevention activities that we should be looking at and using as a model for how we, we um, focus suicide prevention programs. Um, 2001 was a long time ago, and we have learned things since then, and it's time to um, reestablish this national strategy to, to change it, to look at it, to see where we've succeeded as a nation and perhaps where we haven't. One of the things it did ask for was a public-private partnership um, to really help guide the goals and objectives in this national strategy. Um, and so the, the Action Alliance was reformed last year. Um, it is a, a public-private uh, uh, partnership. Um, and um, is co-chaired um, by John McHugh, who, McHugh, who is um, the Secretary of the Army, um, as well as Golden Smith, who is the private co-chair, who's the president and CIO of the National Association of Broadcasters. So they're two pretty powerful people. Um, and Gordon Smith um, is a prior senator whose son actually died by suicide. So this is a near and dear venture to his heart. Um, there are several task groups that are formed under this Action Alliance. You can look it up um, online. You, all you have to do is Google Action Alliance. Several of us here have been involved um, in the, the new development of the new strategy, and we're encouraging input um, from everyone. So I encourage you to get online and to look at the site and um, to get involved where and when you can. So that was my PSA for... Uh, for the afternoon. So when we look at veteran suicide, the VA has developed a basic strategy for suicide prevention. Um, suicide prevention requires ready access to high quality mental health and other health care services, which is supplemented by programs designed to help individuals and families, number one, engage in care, and number two, address suicide prevention in high risk patients. So we kind of had to choose some areas um, where we thought we could make um, the biggest difference when dealing with the enormity of, of the problem. Um, so our whole first set of um, strategies involve access to care, engaging people in care, um, and getting people to seek um, services and to help them do that. And then we have, um, along with that, a what we call an enhanced package of care for people that we've deemed to be at high risk. And often these are people who have already attempted suicide or those who um, exhibit a lot of the, the risk factors, um, have called the crisis line, have told us that they um, are, are thinking of, of hurting themselves or killing themselves. Um, or otherwise uh, we know to be um, in that high-risk group. We've established a couple of hubs of expertise. One of these is the Center of Excellence in Canandaigua um, that, that I work out of, um, and another one is the Mental Illness Research and Education Clinical Center in Denver, Colorado. Um, which really focuses in on the kind of biological aspects of suicide as well as specific clinical interventions. Um, so our Myrick in Denver works closely with people that you've already heard about um, this morning, David Jobes being one of those, um, and Greg Brown and Barbara Stanley um, have also collaborated with us on, on lots of our projects coming out of the Myrick. We've um, developed some national programs for education and awareness. Um, our uh, 
the VA version of the gatekeeper uh, training program is called Operation Save. Um, know the signs, ask the question, validate the feelings, and expedite help. Um, we have several uh, programs available for education and training um, online that are also available for us to share. I mean, once something is developed in the VA, it's public information. So if you want any of these, um, let us know, um, and they're available. We have a suicide and risk management training for clinicians program. We've done a lot of work um, in the area of traumatic brain injuries and suicide. We have a Women Veterans and Suicide Program, an Older Veterans and Suicide Program, and we've partnered with AAS um, to provide a primary uh, uh, care provider training. We've also developed the crisis line, which you've heard a little bit about. We've partnered with um, SAMHSA and our Lifeline partners to provide this service. We use the national number. We feel very strongly that, that veterans live all across the country and that veterans and the rest of the country should have the opportunity to call the same number and get services. Um, we've opened it up to active duty service members. And so the first thing you'll hear if you call the national um, lifeline number is if you are a veteran or a member of um, the service, please press one. And those calls are connected to the center you just saw in Canandaigua. Um, we think people need options, so we really support local um, crisis lines. We have lots of transfer agreements back and forth with local crisis lines across the country, um, and we're, we're here to, to help people, veterans move, and so um, we want them to get services where they live. Um, we've developed Veterans Chat and Veterans Text, which we'll also talk about in a minute. Um, we have suicide prevention coordinators um, across our country and all our VAs. And we've developed a lot of federal partnerships to help us get this done. Um, our suicide prevention coordinators um, are located at all of our medical centers and our largest community-based clinics. Um, and they have a lot of responsibilities, but primarily they're responsible for tracking people at high risk and making sure that they get the care that they need. They have a lot of reporting responsibilities. They answer these referrals from the crisis line. They do outreach and education in the community. Um, but their primary goal is to make sure that veterans don't slip through the cracks. Um, and we think that this is making a difference. Um, I think you all know enough probably about the VA system to know that we have a lot of cracks. Um, and it would be silly for me to stand up here and pretend that, that we don't, um, because we do. And then the, the numbers of veterans who are getting care is increasing. Um, I think it's also silly for me to stand up here and, and tell you we're keeping up. Um, we're doing our best. Uh, we're, we're doing the best that any large system could do. We probably provide um, on a national basis uh, a better care than, um, than any other really large healthcare system um, out there. But um, these people are at extremely high risk. They need that extra um, sort of wrapping our services around them and shepherding them through the system and making sure that they're not waiting in long lines for prescriptions or making sure they're not waiting for weeks to get appointments, um, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what the suicide prevention coordinators have been able to do for high risk folks. So I would encourage you if you're taking care of a veteran in the community um, and you need to get them VA services or you need to get them hooked up into the VA system, use the suicide prevention coordinator to help you make that happen. Um, and it's a, it's a kind of an expedited, expedited process. Um, the gatekeeper training um, is provided to all of our new employees um, when they start working at the VA. Um, we think that that's incredibly important. Um, and I think that lessons learned from that are the stories that come back um, to us. We've had stories from um, people who drive our vans, um, dropping veterans off after appointments. Um, when the veteran has said to them, you don't need to pick me up next week, I won't be needing um, my appointments anymore. Something after the van driver got the appointment clicked in, in his head and said, I wonder why they said that. And so they referred that patient um, to the suicide prevention coordinator at their site. And, and sure enough, that veteran um, did have plans to kill themselves and really didn't expect to need that appointment next week. 
So um, getting all of our employees and, and people who work with veterans, um, listening for those kinds of cues, I think is in, incredibly important. We're also um, working with the Student Veterans of America, and as Lisa pointed out this morning, a lot of our veterans are returning back to um, college campuses and school programs, um, and some of them are struggling with being able to keep up with their family responsibilities, life responsibilities, going to school, making good grades, um, financial concerns all at the same time. Um, and I think that uh, we need to, to put those extra efforts into making that um, easier for them. Um, so we're um, working on developing the training specifically for them. We have developed an Operation Save training specifically for um, uh, American Indians and Native Americans in Alaska. Um, and uh, are continuing to work specifically with that population um, as well. We talked about the other training initiatives. So one of the things that, um, that, that we've uh, discovered is that um, we truly think we can make a difference for these, this group of patients that we determine to be at high risk um, for, for whatever reason. And one of the things that has, has proven to be somewhat effective is that anyone who comes into the VA who screens positive on um, our regular routine PTSD screen or our regular depression screen, we refer on to um, for, for a suicide screen and a suicide risk screen um, or assessment, um, which has been, um, I th think, um, better for us um, as opposed to doing kind of across the board suicide screens to everybody who walks in. Um, I think by broadening our net a little bit, um, we're, we're catching more people who perhaps might be at risk. Um, and I would, um, if you're working with veterans, I would advise um, using the, the normal depression screens and if people do screen positive, always ask the suicide risk questions. Um, I think it should be a normal part of, of what you do. Along with that, there are specific um, questions that get asked of veterans when they come into the VA that probably now should be part of um, uh, America's uh, screening repertoire. Um, and those are people's exposure to trauma, if they've served in, in combat zones, and if they have had any period of time while they were serving or since they've served um, where they have lost consciousness um, for any period of time. So if they've ever had uh, the possibility of a traumatic brain injury, I think it's important that we know that. Um, that along with PTSD um, and depression are kind of the signature wounds, like I mentioned, of this war. They also carry with them an increased rate of suicide with this group of people. So to be aware of that, to ask the questions, to normalize asking those questions in your everyday intakes, I think um, is really important when you're working with veterans. It's amazing to me, um, even still today, while we're at war, how many emergency rooms um, don't ask the question, are you a veteran or have you served, um, with any um, particular group of people. But I think when um, people within the age group of people who could have served in Iraq or Afghanistan walk into an emergency room, male or female, um, you certainly need to ask the question, are you a veteran? Um, and then along with that come another whole set of questions. Were you exposed to combat? Was there ever a period of time um, when you were unconscious or you hit your head or do you know you have a, a traumatic brain injury? And have you ever had symptoms of a stress disorder? I think those are important questions to ask. When we identify someone at high risk, we do have a chart notification system, so we're able to put a flag on their record um, that uh, is visible by everyone who opens up that record to know that they are at high risk of suicide. We do this with the veteran's permission, um, and it does let people like pharmacists know that if someone shows up in the pharmacy, 
um, for the third time in a month because they've lost their per prescriptions or um, their, their drugs aren't working or they didn't know that they were supposed to take them at a certain period of time and they need more. Those are things that we need to be uh, aware of. It lets people in the emergency room know that this person needs to be asked a whole different set of questions when they come in. Perhaps they're not really there because they have a headache um, or their back hurts. Um, we've also fully embraced the safety plan methodology and for everyone who's determined to be at high risk and who has a flag on their record, it's required that they have a safety plan. We've developed our safety planning, and I'll talk about it in a minute, with Greg Brown and Barbara Stanley. Um, we have a manual, which um, certainly you can download. It is on the um, Suicide Prevention Resource Center best practice list and is available for anyone who um, wants to use it. We require that their treatment plan um, be modified to include the, the whole idea of suicidology, that we ask the questions, that um, treatments um, are structured around their suicidology, their suicidality first, um, which include all of those evidence-based treatments that, that we now know may be effective, such as CBT and DBT, um, uh, problem solving and uh, motivational interviewing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, as well as uh, the CAMS um, concept. We require that we talk about means restriction um, with veterans, and this is a, a, a touchy subject with veterans. I mean, we don't ever want to in any way imply that we are um, restricting people's rights to bear firearms or to keep themselves safe or to, to carry a gun. I mean, that's not what this is all about. What it is all about is keeping them safe and at the very least providing those kind of stalling tactics that Lisa talked about earlier. Um, we do provide gun locks to any veteran who wants them. Um, we've partnered with the National Sports Suiting Association to do this. We've developed materials um, about gun safety that we, we provide. We're in the process now of um, uh, going to and providing these materials at all the yellow ribbon events across the country so that when um, reservists and guard members come back, they have the opportunity um, to, to get a gun lock and to know how to use it um, to keep themselves safe, but to keep their children and families safe too. So I think that's uh, gun safety is, is um, the, the buzzword of the day and we're really concentrating our efforts on that. Um, we've also looked at blister packaging, um, ways to uh, restrict uh, medication um, prescribing amounts, um, those types of things, which is more difficult, but um, we're, we're pursuing those. As part of their safety plan, we do require that veterans identify, if they possibly can, a friend or a family member who we can contact um, if we need to find someone. You know, one of our biggest challenges, both um, from a suicide prevention coordinator and, and medical center um, a view, as well as on the crisis line, is that if someone doesn't show up for an appointment or calls the crisis line as in, in obvious um, distress and, and is in a crisis, um, it's, it's detrimental, um, as you all know, lots of times to call the police. Um, these people have PTSD sometimes. Lights and sirens are not a good thing to, um, to put in front of them. Sometimes it's our only option and we need, we'll, we'll do it to keep people alive, but it's not our first choice ever. When people miss appointments, we don't want to call the police to go to their house to bring them in. Um, but we do need someone to call. We need someone to take on that responsibility. So we want to call their neighbor or their brother or their, their sister who, who often are more than willing to take on this, this task of going and making sure they're okay and finding out why they missed their appointment or, or what the problem is. And just having that contact information has made a, an incredible difference. And we do follow up for these people if they don't show up for appointments. Um, which is uh, an awesome task unto itself. Um, the other parts of the uh, enhanced care package um, do include a mailing program. So they do get, we can't send postcards in the VA because of the privacy rules, but we can send letters in envelopes. So um, we, we do that. 
The safety plan um, specifically is included in the veteran's medical record. We do ask that all of the providers become familiar with that. The veteran gets a copy of it and it includes six specific steps, which um, Greg and Barbara helped us develop. One of those is the, the first one is the identification of warning signs. What really truly does make um, a, a difference in you? What, um, what do you need to be aware of? Um, when do you start feeling bad um, and why? Uh, internal coping strategies. Um, what, what are the first things that, that I can do? Um, we do have a um, PTSD coach mobile phone app, which um, is, has been developed and a lot of our veterans now have that on their phones and are using it. Um, it's free um, from, uh, you can download it uh, and it's uh, certainly worth, worth doing. Um, we have them again identify social contacts who could um, distract from the crisis, family members of friends, professionals and agencies to contact for help, and how they can make their environment safe is all part of their plan. We require that um, veterans are seen within uh, seven days of discharge from um, uh, the facility if they've been admitted for any reason. Um, and then we require weekly visits for the first 30 days. And we do require that the flag stay on their record for 90 days um, after this uh, attempt or high risk designation. And we've just kind of faced the fact that this is a high risk period. Um, and despite what they tell us or um, uh, how they're feeling, we're gonna keep them on the high risk list and provide that high level of care. The crisis line um, I talked about a little bit. It's a toll-free confidential resource that connects veterans in crisis and their families and friends with um, responders. Um, we do have a, a crisis responder training program that, that people go through. About a third of our responders are veterans themselves. Another third are families of veterans. Um, and then uh, another third are long-term VA employees. We've answered now close to 600,000 calls um, since we launched in 2007. We've actually um, called for rescues um, close to 30,000 times. And in 2009, we did add an anonymous online chat service, which um, I mentioned in the video. We never really advertised, we just opened it up. Um, and now we're up to 30,000 chats that have come in and that's growing daily, the number of people who are aware that that's there and, and get in. Um, one of the things that we've been able to do this past year is partner with the American Foundation of Suicide Prevention, um, Dr. Ann Haas, and develop an online um, self-assessment tool. We, we noticed that veterans especially um, what we think now were our, our youngest group of veterans and a, and a large number of active duty service members were getting on the website. They were kind of cruising around. They were looking at resources. They'd come back to the main page. They'd go somewhere else. They'd come back to the main page. They might get in three or four times in a night. And you just had the feeling that they wanted to click on the button that says chat with a counselor, but they just couldn't make themselves do it. So we have another option now that they can take a self-assessment quiz. And remarkably, um, thousands of people are getting in to take that quiz. And then at the end of that, they have the opportunity to stay in there and talk to a counselor or to get a message back within 15 minutes from a counselor or not to, to pursue it. Um, and most of them um, stay in. You know, once they've kind of taken the quiz and they have a way to start the conversation, they'll stay in and, and talk to us. So um, even if the assessment itself is not um, valuable, but we, we think it is, it, one of the huge values is that it's a conversation starter. It's a way to start that conversation. So um, I think that's exciting, especially for this newest group of people. The other thing we opened up in November is a texting service um, where people can actually text us um, and tell us that they're in trouble. And, it, and again, it, it's not that we're able to have therapeutic conversations over the, the texting service. As you all know, characters are limited, 
but it's that connection. And once we've connected with them a few times, often we can say, I have your number, can I call you? They say yes. They've made that connection. They're a little bit more comfortable um, with, with talking with us. Or they'll say no, um, but I'll get into the chat, you know, because we always offer that as an option too. So I, I think we've learned that we have to be there where veterans are to make a difference. I'm looking at it like it's going to change itself. Okay. Um, and then the other thing I, I want to spend some time talking about is the whole idea of um, messaging um, around uh, the suicide message. I think um, many of you probably saw our, our initial attempts back in 2007 to advertise our crisis line and to put the word out there that, that we had one. Um, and those were kind of born out of a desire to get the number out there to let people know that they could reach out for help. Um, in the, in the you know, three or four years that, that we've been doing that, we've learned in a tremendous amount about messaging and we've spent a lot of time trying to figure out what is the best way to get the message across that we're there to help and that suicide is a problem um, and that treatment works without um, at the same time portraying this sort of dismal bleak picture about veterans in general and I think one of the mistakes we made in the beginning was that in our effort to get people mental health services and to, um, to talk about the problem was that we kind of painted a picture that perhaps you shouldn't hire veterans when they come back from serving because they might have mental health conditions or perhaps you shouldn't be friends with a veteran because they might be violent or, um, or cause trouble in your communities and perhaps you should stay away from veterans because um, they're not stable. So while those are extremes in the backs of people's minds, I think we painted some um, inaccurate, very bad pictures that perpetuated the problem. Um, and I think we tend to do that sometimes um, around the whole area of mental health and, and suicide um, to begin with. So I think it's incredibly important to um, number one, um, like we heard this morning, normalize those, those thoughts that, yes, people do think about killing themselves. Um, yes, people do have emotional difficulties. Yes, mental health is important and it's something that we probably all struggle with at different parts in our, uh, of our lives and different times of our life. Um, but at the same time, while those are sort of normal thoughts, so is getting better. And so is our ability to, to change our lives, to get help, um, and to be really productive members of society. Um, and at the same time, we need to portray that image that, that veterans have just gone through incredibly difficult um, situations. Um, by far, the majority of them have been deployed um, into combat situations. They've survived. They've come home. They've made incredibly difficult situations um, bearable. They've made incredibly difficult decisions over and over again. They've contributed as a member of a team to an extremely successful effort. And all of those are truly attributes that will help any um, employer uh, build a productive workforce, that they'll be good members of any team which would, would hire them to do jobs, and they'll be really fully engaged active members into a community once they can transfer those skills that they learned in the military to community settings. So it's our task to help them do that. So creating those messages has been um, a challenge, and, and we need everyone's help to be able to do that. Um, one of our newest ventures is called MakeTheConnection.net, um, and I would encourage you all to get on that website. But it's stories of veterans, um, by veterans, telling their story about some of the challenges they've had and the successes they now have in their lives. And so um, certainly use that. Use it with the veterans that you work with. 
um, encourage them to get on there and, and look at, at stories. And then they can really customize the story according to the era that they served in and their gender and what branch of the military they were in. Um, and, I, and I think it's very useful. Um, we've also developed um, a kind of um, matter of fact, a different approach to um, advertising the crisis, um, crisis line. Um, we did actually even change the name of the crisis line from the suicide hotline to the veterans crisis line in an effort to get people to call earlier. One of the things that we were hearing is that veterans felt like our service members especially felt that they couldn't call it because um, they weren't really suicidal yet. Um, and that they had to wait until they had like a gun in their hand before they could call the, the suicide hotline. Um, so to kind of uh, help people realize that they should call ahead of time, um, we, we called it to the, we changed the name. And I have to tell you, the calls increased by about 20,000 the first month. It was amazing the difference that that change in messaging made. And we did have a big splurge and a big push at the same time, which I'm sure contributed to that. Um, but I think it made a difference. We have the usual kind of Shotsky stuff. We've got the keychains and the wristbands and the um, wallet cards and things. And there's a table in the back. Um, a little round table that has a lot of these products on them. I'd encourage you to take them, but you also can order them from us um, and we'll, we'll send them to, to you, of course, um, uh, at no charge. And the, our um, um, website is www.veteranscrisisline.net um, and there's all sorts of links on there. Um, so back to the crisis line, we went live um, on January 25th of 2007 and we got our first call um, at 11.20. Um, and I actually was one of the strongest proponents of not opening up this crisis line. I, um, I thought there was the national lifeline, we should use that, we should have people refer that veterans to us. Um, I, I thought that, you know, the the majority of veterans are males. Males don't call a crisis line. Um, why would we waste uh, energy and resources on doing this? Um, and I was told, Jan, we're gonna start a crisis line. I said, okay. So um, we did it and I've never been so wrong about anything in my entire life. I mean, the calls just started coming in and they have not stopped. Um, we started with four lines, we're now up to 25 going seven days a week, plus um, the, the computers for the chat services and now the texting commuters, um, computers. And so we can actually take anywhere between 30 and 35 veterans at any given point in time in some way um, into the Lifeline. The partnership with Lifeline has been um, incredible. Um, and they um, also provide backup services for us. You know, we are located in Canandaigua, New York. We do get a fair number of uh, bad weather days there um, and ice storms. Um, the lines occasionally go down um, and Lifeline snaps up and picks up the calls and calls um, don't go unanswered. We have no queue, we have no waiting space um, and it's a kind of a round robin response. So it, it works well. Um, we have lots of staff. Um, calls come into the, the crisis line. Um, we do uh, do phone interviews. We actually have a computer application where we do uh, an assessment. Um, we assess for emotional, functional, psychological conditions. We determine what type of call that's coming in and, and what we need to do about that. And the beauty of the whole system is that we are able to, for those veterans who agree to it, um, enter their medical record if they're already getting care in the VA, so we have that kind of background. We can also drop a, a consult into their record for their local suicide prevention coordinator and let them know that it's there. And the suicide prevention coordinator is required to follow up within 24 hours to that call. So um, I think that's something we're able to do in the VA, which is a, a unique opportunity that we need to take advantage of. Um, veterans chat, uh, again, I've talked about um, a little bit. 
Um, and we do have some new initiatives um, starting, uh, which include involving all providers in our prevention strategies. Um, when we looked at our newest numbers and we, when we were able to look at these 2009 numbers that have just come out and bounce them up against our system, one of the things that um, we realized is we are making a difference in certain groups of people. Um, we're making a difference with, with mental health patients in the VA. So with those patients who are diagnosed with a mental health disorder, um, we're able to demonstrate that we're decreasing those rates. Um, we're making a difference in middle-aged men, which is um, kind of unique in the fact that in the nation, though the rates in middle-aged men or the older bracket of middle-aged men is actually going up over time. Our numbers are coming down, so we think we're, we're effective with that group of people. They also, by the way, are more likely to have a mental health diagnosis because they've been in the VA system a little longer. One of the things that all of that did, while it's very encouraging and we know we think we're on the right track and this enhanced care package might be working, one of the things that's a little disheartening is that we're not making a difference um, in people who, number one, don't have a mental health diagnosis um, and our younger veterans who, who need us um, desperately. And while our rates in those groups aren't going up, they're not coming down either. So we really need to work on um, kind of our more general public health approach to suicide prevention, more perhaps universal screening, but we think we really need to work with all of our providers, not just our mental health providers, to be able to provide um, better services and, and better um, assessment skills. So um, at this point, I want to show another video that, that we've developed um, called Ask the Question. Um, and we're in the process now of distributing this through the VA and the suicide prevention coordinators are using it as a, as a tool. Um, again, it, it certainly you can um, steal it if you want. I know how to ask a lot of very personal questions, but this one is different. These are thoughts I... Um... I never thought I could tell anyone. How, how could I admit to something like that, you know? Thinking about killing myself. Nothing good is going to come with this conversation. <laughs> I mean, where does it end up? Me on drugs? Or locked up in jail? I thought asking about suicide could push them toward it. That's actually not true. <laughs> it was such a relief to finally, finally talk about it. It was so painful holding on to the worst secret ever. So what are some of the approaches that you found to be effective when working with veteran patients in detecting suicide risk? One of the ways that I'm able to determine it is, especially if it's an initial visit with a patient, um, when I'm going through social history, um, I'm able to kind of find out, you know, are they married, are they divorced, are they separated, what's their job situation. There's other things that might um, determine that they might be undergoing some stress, and then I'm able to kind of carry through from there and get a little more in depth. So we've been working on treating your back pain now for several months, and you're still not getting any relief. Yeah, the pain in my back hurts. Just so tired. And I'm getting some headaches, too. Is there any unusual stress in your life? Uh, maybe you should talk to my wife. She says I act all stressed out, and I get angry about things more often. Yeah. Uh, how are they interacting with their friends, their spouse, family, stuff like that. You know, it usually is a good indicator that, to me, that well, something has changed, that I need to explore that a little bit more carefully. Well, can, can you tell me more? I'm just a little irritable, I guess. Well, that's a pretty common concern with a lot of veterans. Uh, what are you doing with yourself these days? Eh, not much. My wife wants to go out, but I, I prefer to stay at home. I'm watching a few games on TV and having a few beers. That's enough for me. How do you feel about life in general? Or positive or do you feel hopeless? I think that sometimes when people get hopeless, they feel that they have no one. And so I try to make that personal connection um, to them so that they feel like they have somebody who's on their side who will kind of join them in trying to work through this. Hopeless? No, I wouldn't necessarily say that. 
I'm just pretty well worn out. I'm just so tired of all this to care much. Well, maybe a, a bit hopeless. Have you ever had thoughts of suicide? Um, uh, no. No. Okay. Well, other veterans with your pain and worries sometimes feel like they just want to end it all. And I just want to make sure that, that you're okay and that you'd be willing to share with me if that's how you felt. And we know that it's okay to ask the question. We know it's important to ask that question. And it seems when one is first practicing with such, you know, the responsibilities are huge and the, the, the hesitation, the caution is, oh, if I ask the question, are they now going to start to think about it? Or am I giving them the thought and they're going to now go ahead and be at higher risk of committing suicide? And the answer is no. You're not speaking to something potentially that the individual hasn't thought about. And asking the question is immensely important. Asking about suicide can be difficult. What are some of the ways you've done it? There's a lot of concern on my part that the question is received as well as possible. So the sense of engagement um, is important, but then it's also fairly easy because I believe in what we're trying to do, and that is to try to help the individual. So making them comfortable, uh, as comfortable as possible um, to hear the question, uh, to make it safe, um, to phrase the question in a way that's non-threatening, um, non-judgmental. I think that's just really important because, um, I mean, patients have a lot of ambivalence about whether, whether they're going to be honest with their provider or not when it comes to suicide. And the more comfortable you are, the, more com the easier it is going to be for them to be honest and really feel like that they're going to get a, a useful response um, and get help or get something that's going to actually make a difference for them. Other vets with your pain and worries feel like ending it all. Do you ever feel that way? Well, sort of. Well, I mean, the thought has entered my head, but I'm just tired, that's all. And that's not so strange, is it? No, no, not at all. But how often do you feel that way? Seems like more all the time. Daily? No, but quite a bit more lately. Have you actually ever tried? I'm wondering how you would respond if someone says yes. Uh, what do you say to the veteran next? At that point, you know, I look at things like assessing the severity or the acuity and the level of risk. It, you know, is this passive suicidal ideation where the person is just kind of thinking, and they'll make comments like, well, it wouldn't really matter if I died, um, versus more of an active suicidal ideation of, you know, do you have any guns at home? Have you have you ever thought about ways you might be thinking about doing that? Is you know, do you think this is something we should really be looking hard at sooner than later, and try to get from them their perception of the acuity of the situation and 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 the weight of it? Try no, never. It's just that I've I've thought about it a lot lately. My wife and I fight a lot, and I feel it's my fault that things go wrong. It's depressing that I feel I'm letting her down. Have you ever actually put a plan together? I told my wife I wish I'd gotten it in Korea. <laughs> Why did I survive? Then I wouldn't be in this mess right now. But, yeah, I know what I would do. I mean, I wouldn't do it near her. I'd go off alone somewhere. I got a gun. When someone's agreed to tell you about this, they really, they picked you. And so you, you have to finish that conversation. You know, you have to kind of sit with them and, and talk about what that really means versus immediately rushing to um, kind of what needs to go in the computer or whatever else. To make it okay for providers to recognize that it might not be a comfortable conversation for them. But then there are many things about what we do that aren't comfortable. And having a comfortable conversation is not always our objective. Uh, our objective is to 
as best we can provide resources and help uh, in managing a whole range of clinical issues of which suicide is an extremely important one. So you've got to always keep that door open. Uh, even when the patient says no, and even if the patient honestly says no, you need to let that patient know that if sometime in the future yes. they're having suicidal thoughts, they know they can come to you and lay it out there. I know things seem tough right now, but I think we can help step by step, one, one at a time. Maybe even bring in your wife and family to help out. Maybe. Okay, sure. So you've been working with a veteran. The veteran has acknowledged that they have thoughts about suicide. What kinds of things can you do to help decrease the risk of suicide? Safety planning exists as a, as a full intervention um, I mean, and there's training available. I mean, suicide prevention coordinators have training for clinicians who would like to, to do that with their patients. Um, and uh, it's a very useful intervention that's very collaborative and allows the veteran to leave with something to help them um, when they're outside of the appointment. There are programs in place to help you with this. Take the load off your shoulders. I'm going to refer you to someone to talk to about this. Is that okay? Well, that sounds good. And thanks. Thank you for helping here. I've got so many problems that seem to be peaking now, but uh, you're the only one I've been able to tell all this to. And that's the sense that comes out of that conversation. Uh, and it's really oftentimes, I mean, you can you feel it. It's almost present in the room. The shoulders drop sigh of relief, wow, I can finally talk to something that's just been frightening me or worrying me or all kinds of things. They just feel okay. And when we've done this well, I think, um, we often will see that response. Are there any other examples that you can give where you've had a, an impact on the veteran's level of risk? Um, an example that comes to my mind was a veteran I met uh, probably a couple of years ago now and uh, he was in my office and he had a very bright affect um, kind of superficially um, maybe a little too jovial um, but then he he kind of made comments in between that that made me concerned so I kind of pursued the line of questioning and determined that he was suicidal and in fact he was very suicidal and he said that he'd been practicing going out into a, the woods by his house his wife frequently left on business and he wanted to do it while she was gone so but he kind of wanted to let somebody know that so that she wouldn't find his body I mean he had thought about it very well his problem and the main sticking point for him was that who was feed his dogs after he killed himself before you know the wife returned um, and his wife happened to be in the waiting room and so I said how do you think your wife is going to feel about that you know whether she finds your body or not well she's probably not going to I said do you mind if we bring her in and talk about this mm -hmm. and he allowed me to bring her in um, we actually ended up um, he agreed to go to the emergency room because because he was so acute um, and you know, it, it, they came back several times, and you know, and he got on some medications. He did very well, and you know, they both really thanked me for being able to intervene. Um, so, yeah, I think it does make a difference. I saw a gentleman had done six tours in Somalia and Iraq, etc. Came in for complaints of knee pain, um, and we were talking, and it just seemed that the physical complaints that he had just weren't quite all of it. More intuitive than anything else. Oh, by the way, how are you sleeping? Eh, not so good. Next thing you know, I ask the question, and he breaks out in tears. And this is a real experience. He just breaks out in tears. He's 26 years old. And he goes, how do you talk to somebody about what it means to shoot somebody? You know, and he was in the right environment. The entire staff was there. It was a, it was a VA clinic that was taking care of veterans. So that piece engaged him. Everyone did what they were supposed to do and embraced the guy coming in in ways they had no, they could never have anticipated. And so each one sort of did what they were supposed to do, which was care for the individual. And I just happened to be the last one in that, in, in, in that stream, and it worked. And so it's, 
it's following the little bit of nuances. It's, it's a big piece of what we're supposed to, what, you know, what we can do. It's so personal, but it's really an honor that he thought so much of me that he was willing to tell me. He chose to tell me so that I could help save him. I expected my visit with the doctor to be about my health problems, you know, but, um, but we were able to talk. And it was, it was such a relief to finally connect with someone, you know, and, and, and to start talking about what was really bothering me. I was frankly amazed that he opened up to me. But helping him get help and begin to get connected with services was as rewarding as identifying a silent heart attack during a routine physical. I can finally see the light ahead. I'm finally getting the support I need. I'm not alone anymore. Um, so I think that um, it's important for all of us um, to ask those questions, um, but most importantly to encourage um, the, the providers around us um, to ask the questions and as a mental health provider um, to be there to assist that provider in in dealing with the answers. Um, and I think one of the things that's starting to work for us is um, the whole idea of integrated mental health services into primary care and that there's a mental health provider there. It's a huge step for those primary health care providers um, to ask those questions um, and encouraging to sit there and, and listen to the answers and be supportive. Um, but we also have to provide a place for them to send the veteran to provide the mental health care to do those in-depth assessments to really ask um, the the mental health related questions and to do complete um, suicide risk assessments to have that backup makes it a lot easier for people in community settings to to do this so we've got to work together to make this happen um, and I think that's the, the lesson I'm learning um, uh, every day that um, I do this job is that um, veteran and, and military member suicide is a huge, incredible um, problem. Uh, it's uh, tragic and it's appalling that um, people would risk their lives um, uh, serve in, in combat and, and deployed situations, survive that, um, and then choose to take their own lives by suicide because they don't think they have any other options. Um, and it, it truly is going to take all of us um, to make sure that they know that there are other options, to be there to offer those other options, um, and to um, help them um, find out what those, those other options and opportunities are. Um, it's going to require all of us to employ those stalling techniques until we can get people help and get them services. It's going to take all of us to, to serve as those gatekeepers to be aware of um, our neighbors and our friends um, as uh, these young soldiers come back and become integrated into the community. Um, it, and it's going to help um, their families. Uh, their, their, their families are also in incredible stress right now. So we've got to be there, but at the other end are huge rewards. And I think that that's the thing that as, uh, as providers, sometimes um, we don't reap the benefits of. And I think you saw a little bit of that in that last video, that when you really are able to make a difference in a person's life, the reward for that is incredibly overwhelming and fulfilling. Um, and we, we just need to keep pursuing um, to get that done. 
We have a lot of messages um, out there. Again, um, you're welcome to get onto the website, to download any of them, to use any of our, our materials. Um, you have suicide prevention coordinators um, in, in all of uh, your communities, and I can help you connect with them um, in, in one way or another. And if you have any questions, um, my email address, which I don't know, there it is, is um, pretty easy, jan.clamp at va.gov. Um, feel free to, to contact me, um, and I will uh, be glad to expound on this. But I think um, I'll take questions, if that's, that's good. Please, somebody have questions. Hi, Jan, and thank you for your work. I'm, my name is April Burns, and I'm a GI rights hotline counselor. And I'm noticing that although I, I was hoping that we're going to have some time to talk about military member suicide, which was not touched on at all. <laughs> OK. One of the things, um, in, in truly, I work for the VA. I, I know veterans um, kind of inside and out. Uh, I, I was um, fortunate to serve on the, um, the Military Suicide Prevention Task Force, um, which uh, did a pretty thorough assessment of the military suicide prevention strategies and efforts. And I think one of the things that, um, that came out for us during those task force investigations. And, and we did um, go to about 20 bases across the country. We talked to um, so soldiers and Marines and sailors and, and men and women, um, is that um, military service members are people too. Um, and that a lot of the the risk factors involved in suicide, um, uh, age, gender, those sort of non things that you can't do anything about, as well as exposure to trauma, um, separation, disconnection, um, lack of belongingness, et cetera, et cetera, are things that happen inherently in being in the military. Um, that you're often serving away from your friends and your family um, while you have very strong, cohesive military groups. Often you're broken away from those for reasons um, of deployment or you come back and they don't, or you stay, they come back, et cetera. You are exposed to um, lots of traumatic situations just um, in the daily work that, that you do. And so all of those are magnified. And I think a general awareness of that is the most important thing we can bring to the situation. There are certainly um, things that we don't know about deployments and the multiple deployments and the effect that that has on suicide rates, et cetera. But one of the things that we do know is that when we looked at military suicide, deployment itself does not make a tremendous difference in someone's That's risk. Right. And so um, while the exposures to trauma are there, et, et cetera, um, the fact that someone was deployed to Iraq doesn't necessarily put them into a high risk category. So it's all of those other things that, um, that come into play that we all know about and know um, how to deal with. Another kind of common issue um, within military and veteran suicide is the, um, the, the use of alcohol and illegal substances. Um, is often a, a stress reliever, a way to cope with time on your hands, um, a way to be part of the crowd and the group, um, coping mechanisms for, for being deployed or, or for being um, away from your family, et cetera. And we all know that that adds um, injury into the situation. And then just one more factor I, I want to bring in, then I'll take lots more questions, is the whole concept of, of TBI. Um, and that may be the one element of um, combat um, itself that provides a physical uh, increased risk factor for service members, both while they're serving and when they return. 
and lots of soldiers suffer mild TBIs or moderate TBIs while they're serving, continue to serve, and that does play a role in how they cope with military life from that point forward. So. Okay, uh, because I deal with people directly who are in the military now, many uh -huh. of them are women, um, uh, rape, harassment, um, bad diagnosis, um, abusive uh, treatment of our military members when they're in, um, very bad medicine, being given uh, a lot of different kinds of medicines from different doctors who d never talk to each other. And um, there are so many things that people are not willing to look at within the military that are causing these uh, suicides. And I'm disappointed that that wasn't addressed, and I'm also disappointed that there doesn't seem to be a place for those medical members to reach out and to get the help they need, because they certainly are not getting that help within the military. And I was hoping that, because I know the veterans and military um, are, are combining a lot more in their in, in working together, this is one thing that is not being addressed by the veterans community, nor is it being addressed by the military. So what what could I what could what what can I provide? So where's their you? hotline? Huh? So where's their hotline, and who do they call? I mean, they call us, but we aren't psychologists. Or right, and they can call us. And we okay, that's right. what I wanted to hear. Yeah, they certainly can call said. us. And again, when you when you call that number, you hear if you're an active duty service member, call this line. We do have contacts for them. We do have ways to get them help, um, depending on what branch they serve in and and advocacy. where they're located. They need advocacy. Uh, yeah, we certainly can service their advocacy uh, people, um, and we do that on a a, a regular basis. Um, we partner with. Um, other outside agencies sometimes, there's a reluctance, understandably, on their part to sometimes reveal who they are. Um, we don't insist that they do that, but we connect them with organizations such as Given Hour. Um, and, and, the res and, and also the GI Rights Hotline org, and I recommend everyone go there. We are a resource for them as well. Yeah, so we okay. certainly should take that resource from you and yes. um, refer folks to it. You know, we, we do have a lot of partnerships with people, and I guess that's the other part of what we've learned is that we're not going to do this by ourselves, like I, I said. And we do have partnerships with organizations um, such as Vet for Vets, um, Warriors for Warriors, um, Vets Prevail, where we do transfer people back and forth, especially if they want to maintain that anonymous nature. Of, of who they are, so we don't let people drop through the cracks. Um, and if they don't want to be referred back to the chaplain on their base, we find them an, an alternative resource. If you are working with active duty service members, um, however, we have found that, that usually the best resource on bases are the chaplains. Um, who, I have not found that to yeah. be true. So, but they will go to the to the service member in the middle of the night, wherever they are. The ones we've connected with have been it's extraordinary, but um, I'm, I'm sure they're not all that way. I'm sure of that. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Like, we do the best we can with with the information. We have to do a lot better. That's right. What else? That was a hard question. I have a question. Um, I'm a, a veteran, and when I was in the Army, I was under the impression that I was not eligible for VA services unless I retired. And it was only after my health insurance went up to $1,800 per month, <laughs> and I contacted the VA that I knew that I was eligible for uh, VA services. Um, have things changed since the time I was in? I mean, are people educated before they're discharged that they, they are eligible for VA services if they're honorably discharged? We hope so. Um, and and it, that, that required a lot of changing. Um, and people's eligibility really varies depending on the era that they served in um, because the laws have changed um, back and forth over, over the years. People currently serving and people who have served in support of the OEF, OIF war um, are eligible, no questions asked, for services if they enroll within the first five years of returning um, or, or their discharge. 
So it behooves all of us, and we, we go to their post-deployment um, exercises, we go to the yellow ribbons, we go everywhere we possibly can to tell, tell these service members that they need to enroll. They don't ever need to use our services, but they need to enroll within that first five years to guarantee services, especially if something happens later in life when they lose their insurance or if they need our services, they need to have been enrolled. So that's the public message of, of today is enroll within the first five years. Um, after that, it, it gets more difficult um, and it's always harder to, to prove things after the fact than it is to express them at the time. So I think that's a, a public message to take away from here. Uh, the second question, uh, when I had my initial intake, uh, medical intake, it was scheduled for an hour long, and the routine question, and he was entering everything into the computer as I answered, uh, but he did a thorough assessment of PTSD and suicide. Is that part of the uh, uh, formalized intake procedure in the VA medical clinics now? It is. Okay. It is. Um, and, and in there lies, uh, I mean, it, it is and it will be and, and it, it needs to be and, and we encourage that, but, it, but in there does lie the bit of the problem is that it's pretty comprehensive um, and um, there's a lot of people coming back. So um, finding ways to complete that uh, efficiently and quickly has become our challenge, but yes, it is. Hi there. Um, Hi. My question is about ethnic variations. Does your team notice any difference in dealing with uh, different uh, people with different ethnic backgrounds? Um, you know, as much as, as our team does notice it, um, and it, but it's pretty much anecdotal information because the VA does not track ethnicity um, for, for various reasons. Um, one is um, we don't it, it's not right, um, it's voluntary, and we don't, we can't, nor do we really want to force people to answer those questions. Um, but in different um, locations in the country and with teams who work with particular groups of people, we do notice some variations. Um, also, we notice on death certificates when they come back to us um, some, some trends. Uh, and, and we follow, veterans follow pretty much the population in the United States, um, not only in regards to ethnicity, but also in regards to geographic location um, and ages. So I think we're, we're more alike than different than the general population. Um, there are groups of people that inherently have a higher penetration of veterans um, as members of, of their groups. One of those um, uh, are um, American Indians and Native Americans in Alaska. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think we need to, to pay attention to that. Another group of people that um, w um, amazingly um, presents a challenge to us are um, people from American Samoa and some of our territories that have a high number of veterans in them. Um, I think that there's something inherent in serving in those populations, um, becoming part of a military unit and then going home where the connections are even bigger, the loss of connection is even greater. So uh, from that perspective, yes. Thanks. Did that answer your question? Well, I was wondering, uh, within some of those variations that you're seeing, is there anything that you could um, alert us to? Yeah, I think... Um, the, the Intermountain West is a huge area of concern for us, um, not only because of its geographic location, also um, there's a lack of access to VA care as well as general mental health care and the high percentage of firearms um, and gun ownership in those areas. Um, and we have very high rates of veteran suicide in that, in that particular area. Another area that's of um, immediate concern to us is the Northwest, um, uh, Portland, Oregon, th those states and up into Alaska, I think for much the same reasons. Mm, great, thank you. Which isn't to uh, minimize the, the suicide of anyone, anywhere, anytime, so. 
Is EMDR uh, catching on as a treatment modality? And if not, do you know why? Um, I think it, it is in, in um, particular locations. And I think it boils down to availability and um, providers who are trained to provide that. Um, is the VA encouraging it? Uh, we do encourage people to get the training to do it. Um, yes. Um, another area that we're, we're kind of branching um, off into, which is uh, new for the, for the VA, is the use of um, CAMS modalities, uh, complementary medicine um, modalities. Um, they're, they're much um, more well accepted in the, the current group of um, veterans that, that we're working with. Um, and they're asking for it. We've got a whole series of demonstration projects going on now um, using mindfulness-based meditation strategies. Um, and now I understand the reason why they might work a little better, right? Um, but we're excited about that and um, think that they hold uh, really promising uh, uh, things for us. Hi. <clears throat> Excuse me. My question is related to um, the sexual assault and the correlation between sexual assault in the military and suicidality, and what kind of programs that you you know have for that. Um, yeah, and I think again, I'm going to relate back to general population numbers that that we know exposure to trauma um, is a huge risk factor, and so um, military sexual trauma um, is a huge risk factor. Um, and we know that. Uh, we also know it exists in both men and women, um, and that uh, we, we offer um, uh, suicide prevention um, uh, activities with our military sexual trauma groups and, and treatment and therapy. I mean, the, the two walk uh, pretty closely hand in hand. When we look back um, at our numbers, um, actually our, our rates um, among women veterans, um, the, the actual numbers of women veterans who get care in the VA, who die by suicide, uh, number-wise um, is really too low for us to draw conclusions about the rates from. Does that make sense? but we suspect that it's a big problem. But when you're only dealing with one or two in a location, if you double that, you've only got, if you had one, you've got two, and so that's really quite not enough to draw statistical evidence from. But, um, but there's, there's some correlations there. And so it's built into our treatment for military sexual trauma. Do you think I'm going to go back sorry. to your comment um, earlier, though, um, in that while people are still serving um, in the military, um, I think the Army has made huge strides, and that's the program I'm familiar with, not, not the other branches, um, in dealing with military sexual trauma issues. But I think the stigma of reporting those issues um, and making it okay for women to talk about them, we haven't moved much at all. Um, and that's an incredibly difficult situation for people to, um, to, to serve in. And um, we have a lot more work to do in that area. Well, I think that's actually across the board in terms of reporting sexual assaults, and it's probably even worse in the military. Do you think there's, um, has there been, um, to your knowledge, like a higher increase in the more recent wars as opposed to the past, or do you have any? I, I couldn't answer that in, uh, intelligently. Well, thank Just you. Just emotionally. Yeah, thank you. Hi, uh, my question has to do with the sustainability of funding uh, for the services that you're talking about, specifically as it might be related to uh, uh, the planned drawdown of services across the forces. 
It's a really good question. Um, uh, we've been fortunate um, in the past few years uh, in, in both the Department of Defense and the VA to, um, to get the funding that we needed and, and required to, to do these programs. And I can speak to, to the VA's program is that um, I have close to $20 million a year invested in specifically into suicide prevention activities. If you count the crisis line and the suicide prevention coordinators and, and the people across the country. Um, my job, for, for example. So I think we've been in, in a rather um, unique and ideal position to be able to put these things into place. Um, it, will, uh, it, it will depend on future funding if we can continue to grow and expand these programs. Of course, the military is drawing down um, considerably on the resources that they have to provide. Um, these services and understandably there won't be as many people in the military to, to provide these services to. Um, but they'll move to the veteran population um, and if the resources continue um, in this area, I think they will for a few years. Um, but if traditionally we look at other conflicts and other wars and other things that have happened, um, it becomes less a factor in, in community people's minds and in politicians' minds. It's not quite as um, popular to fund as it was while we were at war. Um, and it's not that people don't want to fund it. It just isn't the priority that it was. So I think it behooves us to keep these issues in the forefront of, um, of Congress and, and our funders. That was a roundabout answer to that question, wasn't it? Join me in thanking Dr. Kemp. Thank you.